Good morning and welcome to our webinar on return to study. My name is Jenny Burke and I'll be hosting today's webinar and I'd like to welcome our guest Olivia Deutsch. So the Leukemia Foundation would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. I pay deep respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present and thank them for their generous and patient inclusion of us in their deep, deep connection to land, sea, community and to culture. So today we're going to be talking about return to study and education is in such an important part of our younger lives and many of us spend between 16 and 23 years in school working toward a career or a trade. It's where we learn to mature, to socialise and discover what it is we want to pursue as a career. As adults, we continue studying to develop new skills or change careers. So is it possible to study and manage a blood cancer diagnosis, treatment and side effects? Well, today we have two presenters to help us answer this question. So firstly, we have Christy. Christy was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia in 2019 at the age of just 18. She had just begun studying pharmacy at the University of Sydney and was immensely excited for life's next chapter. Two years after diagnosis and treatment, Christy made a gradual return to her studies amid the COVID-19 pandemic. She was then forced to take another year off university to focus on her health and adapt to using a wheelchair after treatment complications for graft versus host disease resulted in a mobility disability. Due to a timetabling change, Christy is unable to be here today, so she has shared a recording of her story with us, which I will share with you now. My name is Christy and I'm really sorry that I couldn't make the webinar on the day, but I'm here to share my story about blood cancer and returning to study. Before I was diagnosed with AML in 2019, I was a first year full-time pharmacy student at the University of Sydney. And I thought I was well transitioned into uni life, but when I was diagnosed, I had to immediately suspend my studies to begin treatment and to prepare for a stem cell or bone marrow transplant. I returned to uni twice since active treatment. First was during lockdown in 2021, where lockdown restrictions meant that most unis were facilitating distance learning. And so I took some units part-time from the comfort and safety of my home. But then I took a year long break in 2022 due to complications and adapting to a mobility disability. Then I returned again in 2023, attending physically face to face using a wheelchair. Each time I transitioned back, I made sure to begin part time and reassess the study load before census dates. I also had to gradually increase my contact hours starting from around one to two hours and building up, which helped pace my pain and energy levels. But crucially, I found that my uni's disability services helped reduce several barriers for both my visible conditions like using a wheelchair and invisible conditions like fatigue and pain. Registering with disability services required some documentation for my doctor and an interview with one of their disability officers. And since my first return, they ensured that I have extra time to finish assessments and adjusted attendance requirements for certain classes like labs and tutorials. But since my second return, they also helped timetable wheelchair accessible classrooms and exam rooms. To receive the, these accommodations, I have to apply for an academic plan each semester, which are forwarded to the course coordinators of my classes. 
The extra benefit of academic plans is that I don't have to apply for special considerations each time my health interferes with study because the plan accounts for most cases. I, so yeah, I think that they really reduce barriers to study for students with chronic health conditions. And due to my health, I had to also experience changing my degree. Becoming a pharmacist was a huge goal of mine during treatment, but as I had to adjust to using a wheelchair, I wasn't really sure if it was realistic or desirable for me anymore. And at the time, I also spoke to the pharmacy dean, and he was concerned that my immunosuppression would mean seeing patients could be risky for me. And coincidentally, the degree was also about to be discontinued and changed. And this meant that if I failed or missed a class due to health reasons one year, I would have to start the degree from scratch. And so after a long period of considering what options I wanted to do, I decided to transfer to study psychology. And so currently, I am a part-time second-year psychology student still at UCID. Um, my health issues are less salient, but I still manage various health problems nearly five years post-transplant. And subsequently, I still don't really think I can do full-time work or study indefinitely. I've also found engaging socially at uni is a bit difficult due to these issues, but Otherwise, I'm really enjoying studying psychology and I'm carefully considering whether to pursue clinical psychology. But I want to try, I want to be transparent and point out that I heavily depend on my family. I still live at home in Sydney and I benefit from their financial and logistical support. My parents have also been really supportive to my return to study, which I know is not everyone's experience. And also, I guess, getting diagnosed at 18, I think having AML delayed my journey to independence as a young adult. And I'm still exploring what autonomy looks like now with my disability as well. But to conclude, I think that my non-linear experience returning to study kind of shows that survivorship is quite complex. For me, survivorship has been a mixture of joy and sorrow, joy for all surviving and regaining some autonomy and normalcy, but sorrow for lost expectations and choices. For study, I've had to reluctantly accept that I can't study full time, graduate with my friends, having interruptions due to health issues and changing degrees. And I think it's normal to grieve these changes. And I think sometimes I revisit that grief even long afterwards but i hope that others returning to study know that it's possible with chronic issues and that there's lots of support available and i and i hope that um they can give grace and patience to themselves through the process thank you that's christy I'd now like to introduce Olivia Deutsch, who's an occupational therapist and education and vocation consultant. So Olivia has completed a Bachelor of Occupational Therapy and graduate certificates in Adolescent Health and Welfare and Research. She worked as an occupational therapist at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre for five years with adults and young people before joining the Victorian Adolescent and Young Adult Cancer Service in 2012. Her role is to provide education and vocational support to young people with cancer, and she's a very strong advocate for staying engaged in developmentally important tasks from diagnosis and throughout the treatment and survivorship directory. So thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Jen, and also thank you, Christy, for setting the scene so eloquently. Many people find that cancer disrupts their education goals or plans in some way. Furthermore, this impact can continue for a number of years post-treatment. This is something that I feel strongly is addressed 
given education often is an important life domain. It provides daily structure and routine, a sense of purpose and accomplishment, important social opportunities, and also future financial stability. So regardless of your situation, this presentation is about mitigating or managing the impact of cancer on your education goals. And we'll cover the following topics. Acknowledging and normalising common concerns, setting realistic and achievable goals, understanding inherent course requirements, your rights and options, identifying your disclosure and communication preferences, considering factors affecting your academic capacity, seeking advice, accessing academic support and adjustments, and utilising additional services and resources. So the thought of continuing, resuming or commencing education often raises an array of concerns. Some of the common concerns that I see when working with young people include not being able to attend classes due to treatment regime or poor health, reduced academic capacity due to symptoms and side effects, uncertainty regarding capabilities and options, difficulty setting goals and planning for the future, Feeling as though goals and priorities have changed, but not knowing what you want to do or how to get there. Falling behind and feeling as though it's too hard to catch up. Not graduating with your peers. Feeling self-conscious about altered appearance. Not knowing what information to disclose regarding your diagnosis. And finally, feeling reluctant to ask healthcare teams about education for fear of being told that you need to be focusing on your treatment and health. These concerns may or may not resonate with you and you may have completely, you might have completely different ones to the ones I've mentioned. However, I want to provide reassurance that there is a range of supports available to assist with addressing these really common concerns. So how do we go about this? I think in the first instance, it's really important. It's really a good starting point to work out what's important to you and what goals and priorities you want to focus on. This could be continuing to study, commencing a new course, changing courses, or actually taking some leave to work out what you want to do and actually get through your treatment. So a crucial element to help you with working out and setting realistic and achievable goals is understanding inherent course requirements and your rights. So inherent course requirements are the essential tasks and activities that need to be performed in order to achieve core learning outcomes. Unfortunately, cancer and its treatment can sometimes affect people's ability to perform these such tasks which may mean that goals unfortunately need to be reconfigured. We will look at reconfiguring goals a little later in the presentation. However, for students who are capable of performing inherent course requirements, under the Disability Discrimination Act, education facilities are legally required to provide academic support and reasonable adjustments. These supports and adjustments are to minimise the impact of cancer on your education ensure you are not disadvantaged compared to other students. This is what we refer to as equity and the importance of this I think is really beautifully highlighted by the cartoon presented here. So the term disability may not resonate with you. However, please don't be offended or deterred. In the context of education, it simply refers to reduced academic capacity, which can be due to a range of reasons, including the impact of cancer symptoms and side effects. So another important element of goal setting is understanding your options. If you have not finished high school, please do not think this will prevent you from pursuing further education. There are many options available, including TAFE, which offers a huge number of courses in a diverse range of fields. TAFE also provides a pathway into many university degrees. The answer to which is the best option for you often depends on a number of factors 
This includes your goals, your academic capacity and entry requirements, course hours and length, approaches to teaching and learning, for example, practical versus theoretical and on campus versus online and self-directed, course location in terms of distance from home and transport options, and also financial costs and whether loans are available. So in terms of loans, HEX help is available for those enrolled in Commonwealth supported places and fee help is for domestic fee paying students. It is also worth considering the free TAFE courses, which are available to all Australian citizens, regardless of your education level. There are also a number of private education facilities available who offer very similar courses to TAFE. However, there is a caution in that their fees may be considerably higher and their levels of accreditation may vary. They also may not be able to offer the same support. So another important component to consider is your disclosure and communication preferences. So while students are not legally obliged to inform their education facility of their diagnosis, unless it impairs their ability to perform essential um, requirements or causes a health or safety risk to themselves or others. However, having said that, it can be really beneficial for a number of reasons. This includes enabling access to academic support and reasonable adjustments, which can assist with minimising any impacts and ensure you're not disadvantaged compared to other students. It can also reduce the stress associated with trying to keep it a secret. And another factor is that it can actually really prevent any assumptions or misunderstandings about the reasons behind any changes to your academic capacity. So whether, what and how you choose to tell others about your cancer diagnosis is completely up to you. However, to reduce being caught off guard, it can be really helpful to consider in advance, who do you want to tell? You may be happy for everyone to be informed or prefer to keep it contained. What do you want to tell? You may feel comfortable sharing a lot of detail or only the very basics. For instance, this could be as simple as saying you have a medical condition. It can also be helpful to practice what you want to say with family or close friends. Another fact to consider is how do you want to tell? You may want to inform academic staff yourself, in person or via email, or have the Equitable Learning Service do this on your behalf. We'll discuss more about these Equitable Learning Services later in the presentation. So we'll now move on to the impact that cancer and its treatment can have on academic capacity and engagement. It's important to note that impacts differ greatly between individuals, given different diagnoses, treatment regimes, how bodies respond, and the demands of course that they are undertaking. However, we'll look at some of the common ones experienced by cancer patients generally. And it can be really helpful to consider these factors in terms of physical, cognitive, emotional, and practical domains. So in looking at physical impacts, this may include cancer-related fatigue, which is one of the most common side effects that cancer patients experience. And it's really important to distinguish this from tiredness, given it's often incredibly debilitating and distressing can cause a feeling of whole body exhaustion, is not the result of recent physical or mental activity, and generally doesn't resolve with a good night's sleep. This can obviously have a severe impact on academic capacity. This picture was sent to me by a patient who felt that it perfectly depicted the fatigue that she was experiencing. So other physical impacts may include disrupted sleep, pain or discomfort, risk of infection due to immunosuppression, impaired mobility, which can make it difficult to sit comfortably, take public transport or mobilise around campus, impaired hand or arm function, which can make it difficult to write and type, and deficits in vision, hearing or speech. So in looking at cognitive impacts, cancer-related cognitive impairment is another really common side effect that can severely hinder academic capacity given it can result in difficulty with thinking clearly and sustaining concentration, 
comprehending and remembering information, following instructions, planning, organisation and time management, attending to more than one task at a time, completely completing tasks quickly and efficiently, and communicating with others, which can include keeping up with conversations and finding the right words. In terms of emotional impacts, this may include distress that arises at different time points due to concerns regarding health, skin anxiety, fear of recurrence, and impact on one's life, including loss of normalcy. These concerns can contribute to cancer-related fatigue and cognitive impairment, and may also lead to social withdrawal or avoidance, including reluctance to attend campus. So in terms of practical impacts, this may include financial stress with difficulty affording education associated costs. It may also include difficulty getting to campus due to transport issues. For example, if you don't drive or unable to drive or take public transport. And for international students, this may include concerns surrounding their visa. So the cumulative effect of these factors, the cumulative impact of these factors may significantly hinder academic capacity with difficulty attending classes and completing practical components, sustaining concentration and attention, processing, retain and recalling information, which is likely to be exacerbated in a class environment where there are often a number of distractions, reading and comprehending complex information or for extended periods of time, completing lengthy essays, preparing for exams, formulating responses when under time pressure, and managing multiple assessment schedules. I'd like to highlight here that most of these impacts and the cumulative impact they have on academic capacity are invisible, and therefore they're not often evident or understood by others. So this is one of the reasons as to why accessing support is so important, one, as to why accessing support is so important. So you may be experiencing many, some or none of the impacts or completely different ones. We will now look at strategies and supports that may assist you with mitigating or managing these impacts. So firstly, it can be really helpful to write down any of the impacts that you are experiencing or concerned about and have questions and any questions you have, such as, am I able to meet inherent course requirements or do I need to reconfigure my goals? Are there any tasks or activities that I need to avoid? Can I complete the theoretical components first and practical components once my physical function or medical status has improved? Do I need to reduce my study load? Are there any supports or modifications that need to be implemented? So once you've got your list of questions, then consider who's best to assist you with answering them. Is this your treating oncologist? nurse, GP, course coordinator, or other specialist healthcare professional. So in addition to assisting with answering some of these questions, specialist healthcare professionals can also help with mitigating or managing the impact of cancer on your academic capacity. For instance, occupational therapist can support people to achieve optimal function by addressing physical, cognitive and emotional aspects and this includes the impact that it has on education. So for example, they might provide strategies for managing cancer-related fatigue and cognitive impairment. Social workers specialise in providing emotional and practical support and can, and can assist with transport, accommodation, financial and legal matters. Psychologists can assist you with adjusting to life alongside and post-cancer treatment. And physiotherapists and exercise physiologists can assist with addressing physical and mobility issues and assist you with regaining fitness and stamina, which can also improve fatigue. In addition to these healthcare professionals, careers counsellors can support you with identifying suitable career options and education pathways. So we'll now look at academic support and adjustments that are available. And this is imperative to assist with managing the impacts 
optimise your academic capacity and ensure you're not disadvantaged compared to other students. So academic supports and adjustments are implemented through the equitable learning services within education facilities. The name of these services vary, however, often include the terms equitable, accessibility, diversity and disability. Even if you don't feel you'll need support, it often saves a lot of stress if you have a plan in place in case your circumstances changed. And as Christy mentioned, it means that you also don't have to apply for special consideration when you're needing to extensions for um, assessment tasks, for example. In order to register with these services, a healthcare professional needs to complete a registration form or supporting documentation, which outlines the impact of diagnosis on treatment and treatment on your academic capacity and provides recommendations regarding reasonable supports and adjustments. So as you can see here, there is definitely a range of academic supports and adjustments that can be accessed depending on the impacts affecting your academic capacity. So for instance, if attendance is restricted due to your treatment regime or health, adjustments may include flexibility with attendance hurdle requirements, allocation of timetable preferences, and modified course delivery with reduced course load and ability to study via distance or online. If it is difficult to complete assessment tasks, adjustments may include renegotiation, renegotiation of due dates and oral or in-person assessment tasks modified to written or video assessments. If it is difficult to complete exams, supports and adjustments um, that may be implemented include that exams are modified to written assessment tasks, that they're completed online instead of in person, that they are rescheduled to a different date, that they're split into two separate exams which are completed on different days. I will preface this with noting that this does not mean you get to see the whole exam and then take those questions home and study madly. It just means they will put it into two completely separate exams. You might also have um, extended time to complete the exam, with, um, which includes rest breaks. And another option is completing the exam on a PC if you're experiencing difficulty with handwriting or planning and structuring responses under time pressure. If um, physical function is impaired, then supports may include provision of equipment, for example, assistive technology and ergonomic furniture, allocation of a scribe, or ensuring safe access to all buildings and amenities. It is important to note that access to these supports and adjustments is dependent on the impacts you're experiencing and course structure, as some of these may not be feasible. So in terms of leave of absence, if you're needing to, if you're unable to continue studying and do need to take some leave, you can generally take leave up to 12 months without requiring supporting documentation. If needing to take leave greater than 12 months, you may need to provide supporting documentation stating that you're medically unfit to study and this may need to be approved by your course coordinator. As um, Christy also pointed out, census dates are a really important um, key date to keep in mind, as this is the last date you can withdraw from a subject you are studying without incurring academic penalty or financial liability. So census dates vary between universities. However, they're usually one month post semester commencement. It's therefore a good time point to review whether you're managing your course load or whether it needs to be reduced prior to this date. And in thinking about whether you're managing your course load, I really recommend that you consider this in terms of your study life balance, as this is a key element to managing side effects, particularly cancer related fatigue and cognitive impairment. If you do begin experiencing circumstances post the census date that prevent you from successfully passing or completing a unit, you can apply for approved withdrawal without academic penalty. If you're approved, this means that you won't have a fail grade on your academic transcript 
and it'll be changed to withdrawn incomplete or something similar depending on your education facility. You should also be approved for remission or recredit of debt or refund for that unit. However, at some education facilities, this requires a separate application. To be eligible for approved withdrawal, you need to prove that your circumstances were beyond your control, did not make their full impact until after census date, and made it impractical or impossible to complete the requirements of the course or, or the unit that you are undertaking. Circumstances may include disease progression, exacerbation of symptoms, or at times emotional distress. For example, if you're experiencing fear of recurrence due to scans that you have coming up. An inability to make the um, now we'll look at the reconfiguring of goals. So this can often occur if unable to meet the essential or inherent requirements of a course. This can obviously be an incredibly challenging and distressing time. However, it's obviously important for one's own safety, safety of others, and helps to ensure that education and goals are realistic and achievable. So if you're needing, if needing to reconfigure goals, it can often be helpful to look at values-based goal setting. As whilst you may be unable to achieve your goals that you've set, you can always work, work towards your values, which act like a compass and point you in the direction you want to head. An example of this is a patient I worked with who had her heart set on becoming a nurse. However, unfortunately, due to impaired upper limb function as a result of a bone cancer diagnosis, it was determined that she was unable to meet the inherent requirements of a nursing degree. This was understandably devastating for her. However, we adopted a values-based, um, we adopted values-based goal setting to identify what it was that drew her to nursing in the first place. From this, she was able to identify that her values also aligned closely with social work. I'm really pleased to report that she completed her degree a number of years ago and is continuing to find social work rewarding. She's also relieved and thankful that she did not end up shooting a career that could have put her upper limb at further risk of impairment. So in addition to values-based goal setting, other strategies that may be helpful to reconfigure your goals include discussing your capabilities with your healthcare team, accessing free careers counselling through Skills and Job Centre, investigating um, opportunities through Seek Volunteer, there is an array of positions available that may spark your interest in a field that you had not previously considered. In terms of support services, there are a number available that you may find beneficial. This includes the Skills and Job Centre, which is a government funded service that is free for all Victorians. It offers a range of careers counselling, invest, um, it offers a range of careers counselling services, which includes investigating suitable course options. There are also a range of services available within TAFEs and universities. This includes academic skills support in relation to writing assignments, referencing note taking and exam preparation, which is a particularly um, useful service for those that haven't actually studied for some period of time. There is also financial um, and accommodation and counselling support services available within education facilities. In terms of financial support, I also recommend that you investigate whether your education facility offers scholarships that you might be eligible for. These are often included under the umbrella of equity and diversity or disability. For those undertaking an apprenticeship, there is the Disabled Australian Apprenticeship Wage Support Scheme. And additional support services include the Cancer Council's Pro Bono Program, which is offers free legal and financial advice, and also Study Melbourne which is a state government funded service that is um, specifically for international students and offers a range of services. So here's a list of resources that you might find helpful, which includes a brilliant fatigue um, management webinar on the Leukemia Foundation website, which I highly recommend if you have not seen it already. Um, there is also um, other services available, such as there's a CAN sleep service available at Peter Mac and 
really beneficial resources available on the web, their website. So in summary, continuing resuming or commencing further education alongside or post-cancer treatment can often be extremely stressful. Whatever your situation or circumstance, it can be helpful to know to know that it's normal to experience a range of um, concerns. I recommend that you take some time to work out what's important to you in terms of your needs, goals and priorities. Also seek support and raise any concerns you have about side effects or other impacts with healthcare professionals. And have that support to ensure you're able to set realistic and achievable goals and manage the impacts. And finally, remember that you are entitled to academic support and adjustments to ensure, to ensure that you're playing on a fair field. Thank you. Oh, that's been an incredible amount of information provided today from both of our excellent guest speakers. So I'd like to thank Christy for so willingly sharing her story, for her honesty and generosity. <laughs> and Olivia, to you for sharing your knowledge, expertise and time with us today. And Olivia's generosity is extended to coming in on her day off to share with us. And most importantly, to all of you who joined us today, we encourage you to use this information to start a conversation and to help guide your care, recovery and quality of life. And in case you have any questions or concerns, please call us on 1800 620 420 as our blood cancer support coordinators are there to help. Thank you so much for your attendance. We'll see you next time. Bye.